Pretty scary, ain't it, Norm? Don't go out there. There's something in the mist. And that's a start. Let's rock. So we meet this guy, David Drayton, who's taking his family down to the basement because they saw a little lightning in the distance. But if he hadn't done this, he would have got hit by a tree and would be dead. He isn't. I, I wish he was, but he isn't. So I guess him being overly cautious was a good thing. For a moment there last night, I thought we were going to take off and head for Oz. <laughs> The next morning, his son Billy wants him to see what happened to his boathouse, because apparently the wind was blowing the opposite direction in the neighbor's yard, and a tree fell on that too. Two fronts meeting? Something like that? David goes next door to get insurance information from Mr. Norton, but Brent sued David last year, and they have some tension between them. And I'm glad that tree fell on your boathouse, you know that? Glad. But when he gets there, it appears that the wind was properly working in Mr. Norton's yard, and the boathouse tree just went rogue. You mean like a tornado? Shut up. But another tree crushed his car, and he's hoping he can get a ride into town for supplies. So David, Brent, and Billy all head to town to go to the hardware store and to get groceries since the power's also out. Well, they stupidly go to the grocery store first so they can let more food go bad as they wait in line at the hardware store that's probably just as busy as this place. Please, get your head out of your ass. While they're in line, David talks to some ladies who also had some damage. The school's roof caved in, and this realtor's worried that her signs might have blown over. It appears we may have a problem of some magnitude here. But there are some army guys that came in, and a military cop comes in to tell them that their leave's been canceled. And they're all like, man, we had to stop for snacks in the busiest grocery store with no power instead of just going on vacation in uniform like we planned. And then some cop cars and a fire truck drive by, and Sally the cashier looks up for two seconds and gets bitched at for not working. Oh, that son of a bitch. What a wiener. And then an air raid siren goes off, and some guy with a bloody nose comes running in and claims that there's something in the mist. Something in the mist! And they need to stay inside. Well, some dude doesn't want to stay inside, and he runs out to his car, and he dies. <laughs> as the fog fills the parking lot, don't want to get sued. I mean, as the mist fills the parking lot, the people all start speculating what they think it is. It's a pollution cloud. Some kind of chemical explosion has to be. I tell you, the goddamn mills blew up. It's death. And then an earthquake hits. But David takes this opportunity to steal someone's shopping cart, but some lady's like, those are my cornflakes, asshole. Stealing food now? Also, no one covers their head while things are actively falling from the ceiling. Everyone now believes Dan, except this one woman who left her children home alone. She wants someone to walk her home, and everyone's like, fuck that. You don't have much faith in humanity, do you? None whatsoever. They even try to tell her that her kids will be by themselves for even longer if she's dead. Ain't it the truth? Ain't it the truth? But she calls all the men pussies for not wanting to go out where they just heard a man die. Someone should still help her. Well, that would be nice of them. But right now, they have no idea what's actually killing people. And walking women home is to deter other humans from hurting them. Men don't have some magical penis power that could save her if that's poisonous gas. You know, I ain't making excuses, I'm just saying. But her trying to emasculate them doesn't work, so she leaves by herself. I help you all. I need help. Having spoken, the doomsayer departs. Billy's in shock, so David goes to the loading dock to get a moving blanket to cover him. When he gets back there, he sees that the generator is smoking, so he turns it off. But him falling over shit in the dark lets something know he's in there, and it tries to get in the loading dock door. When he's rushing out, he bumps into the assistant manager, Ollie, and a couple of mechanics who are heading back to turn it back on. David warns him that something was trying to get in, but when they get back there, the noise has stopped, so they think he just got scared of the dark because he's some pussy artist college boy. What choice do they have? They determine that the exhaust is blocked outside, so they need to clear it. And the stock boy Norm volunteers to go, even though he was scared when the lady wanted somebody to go with her. Hey, I want to go. It was my idea. And everyone but David is okay with this, because I guess they forgot that someone has already died by going outside. Well, that was a long time ago. I'm sure he's forgotten about that. David warns him again, and one of the mechanics, Jim, threatens to beat the shit out of him. So they open the door and see that the mist is just chilling. And then they start mocking David because something doesn't immediately come in. But then they stop laughing because a tentacle grabs Norm and David's the only one who tries to help him. The mechanics cower in fear while more tentacles come in, but Ollie gets an axe and almost cuts Norm's head off. There's nothing left for them to do to save Norm, but they can save themselves. They need to turn the power back on, so Ollie goes over to the generator and David uses a mop to close the door. He then picks up the axe and hits the big tentacle even though it's retreating, but he does manage to cut off the tip. As he catches his breath, he looks at Jim like, I'm sorry, which one of us did you say was a pussy? 
and all of this could have been prevented if they would have just closed the door when they first saw the tentacle, which should have been a reflex, and then they might have been able to save Norm. Yeah, right. So Jim tries to blame David for not being descriptive enough of the noise he heard, so David beats the shit out of him. Ain't going very well, is it? But now they have a better idea of what's out there. They debate on whether to and how to tell the others what they saw. I'm not sure I believe it. I was here. The other mechanic, Myron, is like, we shut the dock door, we're safe. But Ollie's like, the front of the store is glass, jackass. <laughs> oh, shit. What was your first clue? So now they know that they need to barricade the windows and they have to say something to him. So David goes over to Brent since he rallied a group of out-of-towners who are planning on leaving to tell him what they know. And Brent's like, I don't believe you. This uh, pathetic attempt at a joke has gone far enough. He thinks they're playing a joke on him and they're like, well, you're a lawyer. We have evidence we can show you. You guys like evidence, right? But he won't look. And then Brent starts yelling, so the store manager comes over to intervene. He smells beer on Ollie's breath from the two sips he had after a near-death experience and says that he's going to write him up for drinking on the job. Like, this motherfucker's still on the clock right now. So Ollie tells him to shut the fuck up and calls everybody over so David can explain the situation. The people don't want to believe it. It's a pile of shit. And since the manager thinks that they're so drunk that they're hallucinating... I had Bigfoot's baby. He's the one they take back to the dock to show off the tentacle. A biker also went back and pokes it with a stick, and it flops around, smokes, and turns into a black goo. But now the store manager of the grocery store, you know, the most respected person in all the land, says that it's true. The people are open to the idea that they're in some sort of hentai nightmare. He used this as a chance to put these testicles all over me. Tentacles. And tea. This is a big difference. <laughs> they band together to secure the windows with duct tape and an ungodly amount of dog food. We got uh, real problems to deal with here. So stuck in the store with them is the town crazy church lady. And she goes to the toilet, not to pray to the porcelain god, but to the guy in the sky. She's trying to negotiate with God that if she saves at least one person that she can go to heaven. Which will be hard, because she thinks that most of them are pieces of shit. Today I need a friend like you. I'll just have myself a little squat and shit one out. I thought that church people were supposed to be nice. Well, that's because you haven't worked in retail or the service industry after church lets out. Do you want me to report to you? You want to lose your job? But out on the sales floor, Norton keeps telling people that they're still playing a prank on him because they have no evidence. He thinks his cow's blood on the floor, he refused to even look at the tentacle, and I'm guessing he thinks that Norm is just hiding in a box somewhere in the back. I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm just not that stupid. But there is somebody who does believe the monsters are real. Unfortunately, it's the religious nut job Mrs. Carmody. She thinks that God is punishing them for not believing in him, and now he's pissed. She thinks that he's demanding blood sacrifices, and Norm was the first. So Amanda slaps the shit out of her, which lowers her volume, but then she says someone else will die tonight, and that's going to show everybody that she's right. Oh, come on. She knows that people are going to leave later, so they're probably going to die. How is that a sign from God? Well, people get scared when they don't understand what's going on. And when they're scared, they'll believe anything, no matter how far-fetched it is, as long as it makes them feel better. Sure, if he promised to hold his hand, I guess. So David has a group collecting things to make weapons out of, just in case the duct tape doesn't hold. And Amanda offers up her gun. Now, since they only have 12 bullets, they need someone with experience to hang on to it. Now, there are three army guys in the store, but do they even talk to them? No. But Ollie says that he's good with a gun. Gimme, give gimme, give I shot this shit before. And his boss laughs at the idea. But then he loads it, and he's like, holy shit, I work with Dirty Harry. But this is interrupted by Brent and his group wanting to leave. David tries to get them to stay, saying that they have everything they need here, and they should just wait to be rescued. But he doesn't want to hear it, so David's done arguing with him. He simply asks him just to tie a rope around his waist to prove that he made it at least that far without getting dead. But the biker overheard that this Sam Elliott wannabe had a gun in his truck, and he volunteers to do the rope thing, hoping that Mr. Norton's team will be enough of a distraction for him to get it. So Brent goes outside, and after about 10 feet, he's like, See? There's nothing out here. I'm not dead. And the biker goes too, and they keep feeding him the rope until it tightens. It starts dragging five adults holding onto it, and they keep pulling even when it goes up to the sky. So for a minute, they're flying a biker kite, until the rope gives. Can you save it? Uh, no, no way. And thinking that he might have survived the fall, they start pulling him back in and stupidly don't stop when the rope is covered with blood. No, they're determined to get him back, but they only manage to get half. So thanks to him putting it through his belt loops, the rest of them know that there's something definitely out there. 
And like you said, Mrs. Carmody uses what she knew would happen as proof of a sign from God. She's got to believe him. She's a psychic. We can't do these things without reaching out into the infinite. There's a woman. She's, uh, she's wearing a, a polka dot dress. And later that night, people are looking outside, even though they still can't see anything, and use flashlights and lanterns to help them not see. But the lights are attracting these huge bugs that start kamikazing themselves into the glass. And all these people don't realize that they're just going after the lights. So they turn on more lights. And this attracts more bugs, which in turn attracts naked birds to eat the bugs, and they start to crack the glass. And after they remember how bugs work, God, I think they're attracted to the light. And David yells to shut off the lights, the mechanics turn on even bigger and brighter lights, which of course attracts enough to finally break one of the windows. So some of the bugs get in, and one of them lands on Mrs. Carmody. She prays, and it fucks off. But Sally isn't so lucky. One stings her, and her head swells up to the size of a pumpkin, and she dies. And one of the naked birds got in, and Ollie has to chase it around the store. But there are a bunch of stupid people in the way, so it takes him forever to get it. And on the other side of the store, David's been soaking mops and lighter fluid to make torches. Who knows why, but they do come in handy. This other guy, Joe, saw what David was doing and went to go help him fight. But he trips over the bucket and sets himself on fire. And he must have forgotten how to stop, drop, and roll because he just runs around spreading the fire as much as he can until Dan hoses him down. David's beating the naked bird with a stick while Billy screams for him. And David's like, I'm a little busy, champ. But that doesn't stop Billy from running to him and coming face to face with another naked bird. Ollie has this one in his sights, but Billy's an idiot and just stands there so David has to come get him out of the way so Ollie can shoot it. Yeah, he's a fucking kid. He's supposed to be stupid. After all the carnage is done, they board up the only window that got broken, and some woman announces that Mrs. Carmody was right in predicting what was most likely going to happen anyway. Real Oracle Adelphi, that one. You don't mock me. And somehow, Joe is still alive, but begging someone to kill him. But his brother Bobby is hell-bent on getting him help. Son, you got brass balls. David and Bobby form a group to go next door to the pharmacy to get some medicine for him and anything else they might need. But Mrs. Carmody objects that they're going to attract attention to the grocery store if they leave and come back. So an old lady throws a can of peas at her and tells her to shut the fuck up. She also volunteers Jim to go with them, and David recruits Private Jessup from the army too. And it's a good thing they brought the old lady with them to let them know that the prescription medication that they're looking for will be behind the pharmacy counter. I'm glad you're here to tell us these things. They gather a bunch of pills, but Dan hears something, so they need to make their way out of there. Now, I'm not sure how, but with this many people spread out through the store, none of them saw that almost everything was covered in spiderwebs. You find a black light? The place would look like a Jackson Pollock painting. Like, there are people hanging from the ceiling and tied to the walls. And they even see the MP from earlier that's still alive and starts saying it's all our fault over and over. And then spiders start coming out of his skin and he dies. Then all of these big ass spiders start showing up shooting acid webs. But they were also just touching webs on the military cop. So maybe these spiders have like a Karen AI program too? Activating instant kill. But one of them gets Bobby's leg and burns his pants off. And while they're trying to drag him out, this rando they brought with them gets a web to the face and a spider and all the babies that came out of the MP eat him alive and he eventually dies. Then another spider pops up in front of them, but the old lady makes an improv blowtorch and takes care of him. Then they get blocked at the exit by a hugantic spider and when Ollie goes to shoot, he stupidly forgot to reload, so Dan has to spear it while they all protect Bobby but it turns out that Bobby died from his tiny burn on his leg while his brother survived most of his body being on fire. Pussy. So they just let the spiders eat him. Well, they make it back in the store, and Jim is a bigger crybaby than Billy is. So bad that he ends up becoming one of Mrs. Carmody's biggest believers. Joe also died while David was asleep, so their trip ended up costing them four bullets and two people to not even save the guy and increase the following of the cult that they're afraid will turn on them. We can start worrying about who she's going to sacrifice to make it all better. So now they know they need to leave. But David wants to know more about what they're up against, so he wants to talk to the soldiers. They find Jessup and ask him, but he denies knowing anything about it. But the other two guys might know something. But they hung themselves on the loading dock. Also, Jim saw them go back there, and because the other soldiers killed themselves, they must have something to do with what's happening. So David loses his shit and blames Jessup. So when Jim gets back there, he gives him up to the congregation. Which means that this mechanic that David beat up earlier was able to drag out a 20-year-old soldier who's in his prime. What, don't you think I can do it? 
See, there have always been rumors about the secret projects going on at the base. They have a crashed flying saucer up there with frozen alien bodies. But no one knows for sure. And Jessup says that he heard that the scientists were working on being able to access other dimensions. But he's not sure, because he was just a guy stationed on the base. It's not like he was doing the test or can even confirm that that's what was happening. But just him working there makes him responsible enough for the cult members to punch him and stab him and exile him into the mist and he dies. Right now I'm thinking maybe that's for the best. That night, Billy wakes David up to make him promise that he won't let the monsters get him. Promise you won't let the monsters get me. And the group all gather to make their getaway while everyone's asleep. But apparently nobody was bothered to make sure the door wasn't guarded, because after they realize that the food they hit is missing, they see Mrs. Carmody waiting for him. And it just seems that everyone else was just pretending to sleep, because they all come up to the front to stop him from going. She says that it's not God's will that they leave, because they're the reason God is punishing them. Their group makes fun of their religion, and because of that, one of them should be sacrificed. And God wants Billy. The boy. And why not, let's throw Amanda in there too, just as a bonus. I get the heart, hey. So this group of people, who two days ago were making fun of this woman, Oh, prepare to meet shit. Are like, yeah, how dare these people make fun of my beliefs. Let's kill an eight-year-old. Yeah, let's fucking kill a kid. So they all start to attack, until Ollie shoots the nutbag. There's no defense against the will of God. Then this bloodthirsty mob that wanted a blood sacrifice for their vengeful God is like, whoa, 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 did you really think we were gonna kill your kid for God? I mean, seriously, we barely know the guy. Here, let us move this ice machine out of your way. What, am I impugning their manhood or something? Because I'm sick to death of your bullshit. So the group all run outside, and Ollie gets to the SUV first, and opens the doors. But then a giant scorpion thing sneaks up on him, and he dies. But he does manage to drop the gun on the hood of the car before he gets ripped apart. So, that's good. Thank you, Ollie. But unfortunately, Myron fell coming out of the door, so the store manager and Not Sam Elliott are carrying him. But a spider gets Myron, and he dies. And then Not Sam Elliott also gets attacked by spiders, and he dies. But the manager bumps into every car on the lot and gets back to the store where he begs to get back in. David, Billy, Amanda, Dan, and the old lady get in the SUV and stupidly honk the horn so the others can find him. But David wants to get the gun and he puts himself in danger so he can grab the gun that most likely wouldn't have fallen off the hood while they were driving 2.2 miles an hour in the mist. And he probably could have easily grabbed it, but between the honking and Amanda and Billy screaming at the top of their lungs, a spider hears him and starts coming to get David. But he gets it at the last second, and the spider headbutts the windshield and just fucks off. So instead of just leaving, they've got to do a victory lap in front of the store to show that they made it. And the store manager's like, Oh man, I'm the only non-believer in here. If they go crazy again, I am fucking dead. I'm gonna die surrounded by the biggest idiots in the galaxy. So for the first stop on their trip, they go to David's house and find it covered in spider webs. And his wife is conveniently displayed so they don't even have to get out of the car. Is mommy all right? I'm sure she's fine. Don't worry, okay? And I guess no one else has anyone they care about because they just drive on the highway until they run out of gas. And when the truck stops, they're like, well, we're still in the mist. At least we tried. And they're like, so what do you guys think? Group suicide? And everybody's like, eh, sure. Why not? But they only have four bullets. There's five of us. So that's not enough bullets. Yeah, it's math. So Billy wakes up just in time for his dad to shoot him in the face. And then he kills the others, but still needs to do himself. I'll figure something out. That's it. That's the plan. So he gets out of the car and he's either expecting to be patted down or maybe getting some tentacle butt love, but nothing's coming. Any boogeyman? But then he does hear something coming, but it turns out to be the army, who even have survivors from his town, including the lady who specifically asked him to walk her home, but he refused. I got my own boy to worry about. Not anymore. They're rolling down the street, just killing anything weird they see, and the mist is clearing, so if he would have just waited like two more minutes, they could have all been safe. Well, that sucks, but Mrs. Carmody was right. What are you talking about? She said that God wanted Billy as a sacrifice, and as soon as he died, the mist cleared. Oh my God, you're right. You keep telling me that you can't listen to crazy church people, but they're always right. Just like Ralph knew that no one should go to Camp Crystal Lake, the bowling trophy angel was real, and the Magi knew that the O'Connells needed to fight the Scorpion King, the church lady was right. 
She said they would come at night, but at that point, they only knew about one monster. She told the group that was trying to leave that they were all going to die, and then the biker came back cut in half. She implies that David's wife is dead. She singles Bobby out to be the one that will die when they go to the pharmacy, and she says that God wants Billy and Amanda. And as soon as they're dead, the mist clears. She was right. She said that it would happen like this. No, I don't buy that. It's obvious she's nuts. Wait, do you mean to tell me there's a Stephen King story out there that has a good ending? Holy crap! Yeah, and? How do you two always manage to make me laugh? You have <laughs> incredibly low standards. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure to hit that subscribe button right now. By noon, she'll have four more. By tomorrow night, when those things come back, she'll have a congregation and then... What choice do they have? We gave it a good shot. Nobody can say we didn't. What will end it? Let me hear it. Expiation! What are we talking about? Expiation! Yeah. Expiation! Yeah. Get out of here.